Welcome to the Travel Plus Loyalty Podcast. We are again ready with our Monday morning update. Today, the theme is South African Airways and their history. South African Airways is the state-owned flag carrier of South Africa. They are headquartered in Airways Park at OR Tampo International Airport in Johannesburg. The airline operated an hub-and-spoke network linking over 40 local and international destinations across Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, South America, and Oceania. In 2006, in April, the airline joined Star Alliance, that making the first African carrier to sign up with one of the three major airline alliances. However, the airline started incurring large losses of revenue, operating income and profit. It is now in a state of limbo of whether it's going to resume services or shut down entirely. While calls are also being made to privatize the company and keeping it running, however, the COVID-19 pandemic is further hampering its recovery. In September 2020, South African Airways suspended all flight operations as the business rescue practitioner placed the airline under a care and maintenance until further funding could be sourced. In October 2020, the South African government said it was looking for partners in an effort to bail out the airline. On the 28th of October 2020, the South African government bailed South African Airways out of its 10.5 billion rand in order to implement the turnaround strategy. A turnaround strategy that included that the airline will return 34 Airbus airplanes to its respective letters. That includes all four new A350-900. As of February 2021, the South African government was in talks with three potential investors to revive the airline and resume operations with a massively reduced workforce. As of May 2021, where this podcast is made, there is still no news on who will take over the airline. In today's deep dive interview, we talked to Patrick Menzies, who have worked with South African Airways for over 25 years. We'll go through the history and what happens, but we'll also talk about who might be the possible investors in South African Airways. Let's get started with today's deep dive history on South African Airways. Over to Alan Hoffery and Patrick Menzies, who sits in one of the many meeting rooms in the conference center at the Clarion Hotel, Copenhagen Airport. Welcome to today's podcast. We have uh, one of the grand old men in uh, Danish aviation uh, with us today, uh, Patrick Menzies. Uh, Patrick, could you please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you have been doing for the last 25 years in, in Danish aviation? Yeah, sure, Alan. Thanks for uh, having me over. Um, yeah, 25 years. Just imagine how time flies. Um 25 years ago, I've been in, in uh, the travel trade and aviation since 1986, I believe it is. But um, 25 years ago, I came into South African Airways uh, a bit by accident. Um, I didn't know anything about South Africa. Well, I knew there was this guy called Mandela and all this kind of stuff. And there were a couple of white people and a lot of black people. But uh, apart from that, I did not know anything. Uh, so it was pure coincidence. And pure coincidence turned into a love affair. Um, South African Airways was a fantastic product. South Africa is probably one of the best places I've ever visited in the world. And uh, having been born and bred by an ambassador and, and worked for the travel trade or in the airline business for so many years, um, I've seen my fair share of the world. Um, but I just have to say that the, it, it was love at first sight. It was absolutely fantastic to visit South Africa. And I think that by and large is also the reason that I stuck in with South African um, for 25 years or almost 25 years. Um, there, was, there were ups and downs like um, you see in all airlines. Um, and 
looking at an airline like South African and looking in particular at African aviation, you probably have some elements that we are completely unaware of here in, in Europe. Um, you have these four small funny uh, issues like nepotism, corruption, uh, political infighting, and all of a sudden it becomes a question of who, who has the most powerful connections rather than who is the best commercial leader. Um, but there were also times where SAA had some fantastic leadership, some really, really great CEOs, some good commercial leadership, good guidance. Um, and throughout the whole process, I can honestly say that I think South African was probably on the good day, probably one of the best airlines I've ever flown. I've tried Singapore Airlines, I've tried uh, Cathay, Thai, I've tried a lot of different airlines. And SAA on a good day was up there amongst the best, which also made it a lot easier to actually go out and sell the product because we had a fantastic destination and we actually had a great product. <clears throat> So it's, it's, yeah, it's with mixed emotions that I'm sitting here now and, and having to look back at, at, uh, at an era, you could call, uh, that ended uh, on the 31st of October when the uh, office here in Copenhagen was finally closed down. Um, and the precursor to all that was that SAA in December 2019 um, went into... Um, uh, bankruptcy protection uh, with the intent of restructuring. And at the time, I think my colleagues and I, we were quite confident that uh, they would succeed, but we weren't too confident about which shape the airline would come out in. And it was at the same time that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic was sort of, well, it had, actually hadn't become a pandemic back then because it was still something going on in Asia. And I remember sitting and talking to one of my colleagues in Johannesburg, shrugging our shoulders and saying, yeah, yeah, but that, you know, like SARS and MERS and all that, that's, you know, that's going to stay out with the Chinese. Um, it's not really going to bother us that much. <laughs> oh, boy, were we wrong. Um, and, and, uh, SAA went into bankruptcy protection, as I said, and, and, you know, we were concerned there were forces in the government that definitely wanted to save SAA and there were forces in the government that definitely did not want to save SAA and, and hence my comment about the political infighting. Um, and then all of a sudden Corona struck COVID-19, the world closed down, and, and uh, I'm sad to say that SAA went to pot, as we say in English. It, it, they just did not have the finances to, to sustain uh, any kind of operations. Um, and, and the uh, survival prospects are meager uh, at the moment because, yeah, the, the, the restructuring, has, restructuring has taken place. They, they know what direction they want to go, um, but there's no money. And, and the money that's been set aside for it is, is um, in, in airline terms, a pittance. It's about um, 16 billion rand, which in rough terms is about six and a half, seven million, uh, billion, sorry, krona. And you can't save an airline for seven billion krona. You know, it's going to cost a lot more than that. Um, staff has been cut down. There's, uh, it went from main airline about five and a half thousand staff to the desire to retain about a thousand um, and this is obviously also means that if and when SAA does turn around and come back um, how long time is it going to take them to actually get onto the market again because the market was pretty saturated back then um, we had pretty fierce competition from every airline but there's no doubt that the biggest competitors, and also because of their penetration into the African continent, uh, were the likes of Qatar Airways, Emirates, uh, Turkish, and then the local boy, uh, Ethiopian. Uh, Kenya Airways is around, but they're not really a, they're, they're not a force to be reckoned with. They're apparently, I've never traveled with them, but they're apparently a very good airline. But, but Ethiopian just had managed to position themselves in an outstanding position. Um, and they are the natural link between the BRIC countries. If you look at it geographically, it's a lot easier to fly from, from China via Ethiopia to Brazil than it is to travel down by, via South Africa. 
So those four airlines are the ones that are really have put a lot of effort into penetrating the continent itself, which means that SAA's position of strength back in the good old days um, is more or less gone. Um, they haven't got a domestic network because they're not on the market. They haven't flown, I have to say, since uh, the middle of March. Um, and even though there is airline activity in South Africa, these are all the private uh, airlines. It's, it's Comair, uh, which has a franchise agreement with BA, uh, and it's Airlink, which was a former partner of South African, but an independent airline. Um, and they are very successful at the moment with domestic and regional flights. Um, so, so if SAA does wake up and come back to life, there isn't actually a place in the market for them. And that's, you know, that has to be a thing of concern for them down there. Um, and, and a thing for sadness for me, because as I said, it was a damn good product. I have a lot of, had a lot of good colleagues, um, and they're all in a terrible situation. How is the uh, sort of the corporate market into South Africa? Is that something that uh, is very important from, from, from this part of the world? Uh, yeah. Um, it's the, the, the vast majority of what we would call the corporate market is, um, is actually not really corporate. Sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of NGO traffic, and, and NGO traffic is a bit like leisure traffic. Uh, they wanted it cheaply and as simply as possible, or as simple as possible. Um, so the, the, what we would traditionally call the corporate market, what other airlines understand as the corporate market, um, it's there. Um, but competing, if you look at Africa as a continent, if we, if we disregard airline uh, uh, business and anything else, but if you look at Africa as a con continent, they have a lot of resources, uh, a really huge amount of natural resources. The problem is that, and I hate to say it, that there's, the continent is in such a mess that the extraction and the use of these resources has been... Uh, limited to very, very few people that benefit from it. Um, and and uh, they are actually directly competing with markets like uh, Southeast Asia or Asia in general, but in particular Southeast Asia and China that have huge production facilities that have uh, uh, massive economies of scale, Uh, nobody in Africa really has economies of scale on a global point. South Africa was the strongest fi uh, financial market on the continent. Um, God knows what's going to happen after uh, COVID. So, so the corporate market was there, but it was not very, very strong. And to such a degree that uh, some years ago, I remember a, a, a commercial director in SAA at a, at a global meeting stating that SAA should only focus on leisure travel, um, which to the rest of us was absolutely absurd because we knew the traffic was there. Um, why not try and benefit from it? Why not try and get as much from it as possible? And we were in the, actually in the quite funny situation that our business class on average for the last maybe 10 years had an 85, 90% load factor. It was full. And when we tried to say to them down at head office, listen, guys, why don't you pull out 25, 30 seats from economy class and stick in some more business class because we're making money on it. No, no, we're a leisure. We, we focus on leisure traffic. So they didn't have that kind of focus. Um, And I think that maybe it seems to me that Ethiopian and their senior management, and I, incidentally, I've met their CEO, who seems to be a, seemed to be a very, very sharp uh, guy and, and very, uh, very friendly and a very uh, nice personality. But it seems to me that a lot of airlines in Africa, SAA in particular, they didn't understand the concept. They, they saw themselves as a... Um, Uh, as, as, as part of the state. And when you're part of a state, you tend to have the point of view that, yeah, yeah, well, things will go anyway and they'll take care of us. Um, and for many years, and that probably has to be the last 12 years, um, SAA was actually run from a board point of view by the ex-president's best friend. 
President Zuma's best friend, which meant that there was no really correlation between co uh, commercial guidance or, or commercial structure. Uh, it, it was a matter of, of how can we benefit. Um, and so it meant that the eye was taken off the ball very quickly. And, and there was not really anybody who tried to say, oh, guys, should we focus on this? Um, they were not successful. And it was, it was sad. It was really sad to, to, uh, uh, to watch. And, and, you know, I'm not South African. Um, I'm actually half Australian. My dad's Australian. Um, but I'm not South African. But as I said to begin with, I fell in love with Africa. I actually visited South Africa more times than I visited Australia. Um, some years ago, when I flew into South Africa, and you get a stamp in your pass, and the lady at immigration, she was flickering through my passport, and she looked up at me with a huge smile and said, hey, boss, you like my country, don't you? <laughs> and I had to admit, yep, I like your country. So, so I actually felt quite emotional about South Africa. To me, it was, it was not just an airline. It was not just a work, that I, a job that I had. But, but it, was, it was an integral part of me, and I really... Uh, um, was saddened to see how it went completely off track. How, how is the uh, the leisure traffic into South Africa? Uh, was, was that easy or was it difficult? Because the numbers seems to be more or less stagnant, and then you have a, a spike, and then it, it goes back to normal. How did you see that leisure? Um Leisure was very easy. Um, it, it was an easy destination to sell. For many years, you, we always had this thing that we need, had to discuss safety and security. Um, I think the World Cup in 2010 in South Africa showed the world that, yeah, there are problems, but they are not that serious. And, and we can't run away from the fact that a, a lot of people are, are, are murdered in South Africa every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the sad thing is that most of that is out in the townships. It's, it's not in the tourist areas. Um, and they have so many great things in South Africa. You know, easy sell. They, okay, they don't have the beaches like Thailand or, or Bali, um, but they've got something they don't have. And they've got safaris. They've got animals. They've got f fantastic uh, destinations, the winelands. Uh, they've got some of the uh, outstanding food. And the prices are silly cheap. Uh, you know, sometimes you got embarrassed when you paid the bill after having eaten four people and had wine and brandy with your coffees, etc. Um, so leisure, from the leisure point, it was very easy to sell. Uh, there were a lot of travel agencies um, competing on the South African leisure market in the whole Nordic region or anywhere in the world for that matter. Um, so so um, we were popular. Um, and, and that, that was, that was actually quite nice that, that you didn't have to go in and start from scratch. Um, I still see the South African leisure market, uh, recovering after Corona. There's no doubt about it. The reason there weren't more visitors, um, there's about, I think the last normal year, there was about 45,000 Danes that went to South Africa. Um, and the reason it hasn't grown more than that. I think has got something to do with ease of connection. Um, it was a market where most airlines understood that you could actually get higher ticket prices. So it wasn't cheap traveling to South Africa. And I think one of the issues that I've discussed with many travel agents was that the packages were too bit too expensive. I've seen 10-day packages to South Africa that were more expensive than an 18-day package to Australia which is ridiculous considering that Australia is almost twice as far away. And I think also the travel agencies could see this, that they could have this as a, an, an expensive niche um, and, and charge a premium. Uh, over the last four or five years, we've seen more travel agencies go lower their prices um, to, to grow the market. And, uh, and, and I think there's no doubt in my mind that that will continue after uh, covid Hopefully, goes away soon. Touch wood. But now, uh, waiting for SAA to rebound. <laughs> Who is going to take the role of SAA? Do you think uh, out of uh, let's say the Nordics? Oh, no doubt, it's going to be Qatar and and uh, Qatar and Emirates. Um, Qatar is probably in the strongest position because they have several daily flights. Uh, Emirates um, are in a position where the connection is not very good. Um, but it doesn't seem to have hindered them so far. Uh, sorry, the connection in, in uh, Dubai mm -hmm. is not very good, but, but they're forging ahead. 
And then there's the likes of, of Turkish. Mm -hmm. uh, Turkish seems to be uh, uh, quite focused on, on getting back into South Africa uh, and operating into Durban, Cape Town, and Johannesburg. Um, and I think that's the key. Those airlines have the financial strength to operate into all three cities. Uh, SAA, for the last many years, only operated into Johannesburg. And then it was a domestic connection from there, which meant that they lost a lot of the Cape Town bound traffic. And then, of course, you have the, uh, yeah, sorry, the expression in English, uh, Tom, Dick and Harry. Everybody flies there. Um, everybody and their dog flies there. You know, you've got British Airways, you've got Lufthansa, you've got Swiss, you've got Air France, KLM. Um, just to mention a few. Just, just to man mention a handful. So so, so my bet is that, that but I still think that, that uh, Qatar and Emirates are going to be the strongest player uh, on that field, uh, sharply followed by, by the Lufthansa Group in Turkish. Lufthansa Group merely, purely because they have two airlines in the group that fly there. I think uh, we will uh, now skip to something completely different. <laughs> um, you have been working in uh, the general sales agency side for, for quite a number of years, mm. uh, working with uh, different airlines and uh, Now you have just uh, mentioned uh, sort of the downturn of uh, SAA in, as we know it. Um, how do you f see the the, uh, the 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 trade as such? You mentioned Australia, but uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Africa. But but how do you see sort of the uh, the rebounds of the uh, the airline industry after the COVID? It's going to be very difficult. It, it, it will happen. Um, there's no doubt in my mind, maybe because I'm naive <laughs> or maybe because I deep down hope so, but, but I, no, I, I think it will happen. Um, it's going to take a long time before the airline business comes back to the 2018, 2019, uh, uh performance. Um, And whether it will happen, I'm not even too sure. But but they will bounce back. There are a lot of elements out there that that people don't really consider. Uh, what what's going to happen with all those airline, aircraft on the ground? It, it you know it's it's not a matter of like when your car's been in the garage, you can take it down to the gas station, wash it, and then off you go. There's a lot of elements in there. Uh, and, and I'm sure it's, it's something that you will discuss in, in one of the future uh, podcast topics. Um, but, but it takes manpower and hours and a handful of cash to actually get an aircraft operational. Um, so, so, yeah, we're seeing careful, careful recovery uh, in 2021. Um, but we're talking sort of in the very low single-digit percentage um, Until there's there's widespread vaccination and, and 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 the whole COVID situation settles down a bit, I unfortunately don't see the airline business recovering too much. On the other hand, when it does recover, there's a lot of interesting prospects out there, and I think that uh, the ones that are who are prepared, um, if we're looking airlines only, the ones that are prepared for this new future, um, they are the ones that will succeed. And it's not only a matter of having a lot of money, like our good friends down in, in uh, Dubai and, and Qatar, etc. Uh, it's it's also about having dedicated staff, dedicated manpower that that really will go the extra mile for not only themselves but for the airline. Talking about this, uh, the, the new setup. Um, will you see any difference? In, in the way airlines are setting up their offices around the world. I think uh, we have seen that everybody has been laid off or been uh, made redundant or being on, on any of the governmental uh, schemes. Um, opening up again, uh, in your opinion, what do you think will happen to, uh, to airlines who are maybe not uh, having head offices in, 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 in the Nordics? <laughs> I actually think that if the airlines are wise, um, and you mentioned yourself, I have, have worked for a GSA, um, just to sort of give a very, very brief background on that. Um, when I was hired to work for South African Airways um, almost 25 years ago, 20, uh, SAA was represented by a GSA in this country. But I was hired to work dedicated only for South African Airways. 
and the GSA uh, represented and over the years have represented the likes of United, Air Canada, Virgin Atlantic, uh, Cathay Pacific, uh, actually Royal Jordanian as well many years ago. Um, and I believe that, that the air, if they're wise airlines, they will look very, very carefully at their uh, organizational structure. Because one of the biggest advantages of a GSA, and especially if it's a good GSA, and I'm, we can always discuss who's a good GSA and who isn't and, and why, but if you choose a good GSA, you actually don't have any overhead costs. And at the end of the day, what that means is that if you decide no longer to have a representation in a particular country, and, and we're talking about the Nordics it's, 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 and, and, and Benelux, you try to get rid of your staff there, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. It's probably going to cost you anywhere between, in Denmark, is probably one of the easiest, up to six months salary. And in some other countries, we're talking two, three years salary. Um, you don't have to worry about that as an airline if you have a GSA. Because the GSA has all the responsibility, they have all the 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 uh, um, um, they, they they have to take care of the staff and the the uh, um, the IT costs and all related fixed costs belong to the GSA and don't belong to the airline. And what the airline only does is pay under normal circumstances a percentage of the net flown revenue of the turnover. Um, and in an organization like that, well, if your GSA doesn't perform or if the market doesn't perform, you don't pay anything. Uh, but the GSA will still have the overhead costs. So a wise airline would look carefully at their structure and carefully at their organization and maybe say, well, in a smaller market, we don't necessarily need our own office, but we need a dedicated professional GSA. Um, and just to give you an example, we as a GSA here in, in Scandinavia for South African Airways, we delivered the third highest revenue of all offices in Europe. And this was actually competing to begin with. SAA had many offices. They had an office, their own office in Paris. Uh, they had it in Zurich. Uh, they had obviously in London and Frankfurt where they flew out of Germany and the UK. Um, we were the high, third highest revenue provider, and we didn't have a flight. And we kept saying to them, guys, just imagine what kind of revenue you can pull out of this market by putting an aircraft into Copenhagen. Our disadvantage was that half of them didn't know where Copenhagen was, uh, and, and Copenhagen was not as sexy as Paris. So they decided to pull the flight from Copenhagen and put it into Paris. I'm old enough to remember that there were talks. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and actually, a lot of talks. And actually, uh, we, 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 SAA did actually fly to Copenhagen. Uh, uh, that's about 22 years ago. Uh, they, and, and we said to them back then, it's not going to be a success because it was, it was a tag. And all tag flights, uh, which means basically that you fly from, let's say, in our, in our case, from, from Johannesburg to Frankfurt and then from Frankfurt to Copenhagen. Uh, that's a tag flight. And all tag flights are notoriously expensive and you can't make money on them. We told them, but no, we'll try, which was fine. And they tried and it was fun. Uh, but there were talks to do it again. Uh, and Copenhagen Airport was deeply involved in that dialogue. Um, and we actually had the flight. It was in the system. And we were selling it. And then someone decided that, no, nah, it's actually more sexy to fly to Paris or was it New York, one of those two. Um, so, so we lost the flight. Um, one, one thing that pops up into to my mind, uh, talking to you about uh, your, your years in the TSA business, um, are there any differences uh, in the way that uh, corporate travelers are to certain airlines and, and certain areas? I mean, you, you had Cathay. In one. Uh, did the corporate travelers and Cathay want something else than the corporate traveler to South Africa? Or was it more or less uh, this, the same all over? What, what are people looking for? You, you're the only one that I know that had the experience for so many different airlines. Um, yeah, I, actually, we did. I, I didn't. I didn't find they were looking for something different. Uh, um, they, they, business travelers are usually some of the easiest customers to have because they're sort of a no nonsense type of customer. Um, 
most of them, obviously price is a criteria and, and, and price for whether you're a leisure or corporate traveler, it, it doesn't really matter. Price is a criteria. There's no doubt about it. However, there is more flexibility for the corporate traveler because, again, they're looking at schedule. They're looking at frequent flyer programs. Um, one of the issues that, as you mentioned, we were the GSA for Cathay Pacific as well. And one of the issues that Cathay Pacific had in Scandinavia particularly was that they were part of One World Alliance with British Airways, uh, Finnair, um, and Eurobonus, the SAS loyalty program, is notoriously strong in this part of the world. For obvious reasons, it's, it's our national carrier. Um, they were actually up against that. Uh, whereas for South African Airways and for Air Canada, when we represented them, both members of Star Alliance, um, we had access to uh, uh, Eurobonus members and they got bonus points and, and benefits and what have you. And, and that was actually a USP. That was something we could sell. Um, but, but the, 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 uh, the base principle of price schedule destination uh, uh, doesn't matter whether you 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 go uh, whether you're going to China whether you're going to to uh, Africa whether you're going to the United States um, obviously the advantage being and and I don't know if you noticed the names of the airlines I mentioned bar one um, we were in the fortunate situation of representing world-class airlines um, yeah, all airlines have their hiccups, but by and large, they were world-class airlines. And it's a hell of a lot easier to sell a world-class airline product to a corporate traveler. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jensen, nah, they don't really care. They're looking at the price. And, and unless, unless it's really a dubious airline, they'll fly anyone if it's cheap enough and if it will get them from A to B. Business travelers, not so. You are currently uh, out of the business here in, uh, in the Nordics. What are you missing the most from your from your experience uh, previous? Or what are you uh, what are you missing right now in 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 this? Or are you missing anything at all? Well, uh, in, in the Corona days and the lockdown, here yeah, I'm I'm missing talking to people, um, or actually meeting them face to face because you can always talk to people on the phone. Um, um, Alan, to be quite honest, I'm not quite sure. Um, I've I've been in the airline business for, for what is it, 33, 34 years. Um, and I've actually come to terms with the fact that there is another world out there. Um, and I say that jokingly because I've always known it. Um, and, and maybe it's time for me to meet some normal people. Um, airline people and travel people are a great bunch. It doesn't matter how old we are, we're very young at heart. Uh, and and that I miss. I miss the 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 happy go lucky uh, approach to things. Uh, uh, I miss having the daily contact with with colleagues. Uh, and and you know one of the things that I was really amazed at, just going back way back before I started in the airline business, I used to work for Hertz Rent a Car here at the airport. And our neighbours were Avis, and the ones opposite were Budget. We didn't talk together. We were competitors. We did not talk. And when I started in the airline business and one of the first events I was invited out for, I found myself standing with a colleague chatting to someone from two competing airlines. And that's probably one of the things that I miss the most was this that or will miss um, a lack of knowledge because they might have that in other, bus in, in, in other businesses. But this thing that we were competitors, we were fierce competitors Monday to Friday from eight to four. And apart from that, we were the greatest friends, um, and that, that, that I'm going to miss. But uh, but over and above that, I've actually come to terms with the fact that, uh, yeah, if an airline or a travel job doesn't turn up, um, I'm quite happy to try uh, something different. On that note, um, I would like to thank you very much for joining us today, and, and I hope that we will have you back soon to give your opinion on other subjects. So um, thanks very much. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Alan. It was a pleasure to be here, and you can always count on my opinion. That was the end of today's Monday morning update and the deep dive of South African Airways with Patrick Menzies and Alan Huffrey. We hope you enjoyed it. 
And if you like it, please subscribe and share it with your friends and colleagues. We from the Travel Plus Loyalty Podcast team wish you a very good day. And if you do travel, then we wish you a safe travel.